I think we're gonna get started with the service. Um, so the liturgical elements as well as the lyrics that we're singing can be found at bit.ly slash quicksilverchurch, same as always. Um, and I'm gonna start with reading to you guys a call to worship. This is from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So I'm gonna pray. The prayer I'm gonna pray is in the um, document. You could feel free to pray along with me or just listen and reflect, whatever it is you wanna do. Oh Lord, this is your day, a day of rest, an open door of worship, the record of Jesus' resurrection, the seal of the Sabbath to come. We thank you for the throne of grace that we have access to it through the blood of Jesus, that the veil is torn aside and we can enter the Holy of Holies and find you ready to hear, waiting to be gracious, inviting us to pour out our needs, encouraging our desires, promising to give us more than we ask or think. Give us the blessings the Lord's day was designed to give us. May our hearts be fast bound against worldly thoughts or cares. Flood our minds with peace beyond understanding. May our meditations be sweet. May our acts of worship be life, liberty, and joy. May our water be the streams that flow from your throne. May our food be your precious word. May our defense be the shield of faith. And may our hearts be more knit to Jesus. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flame. faces that I don't know the names of, which is kind of cool. Um, if you didn't hear me at the beginning, you can look up the lyrics to the songs that we're singing at 
Quicksilver or uh, bit.ly slash Quicksilver Church. Um, and I have the lyrics now, so I don't have to stall anymore. All right. day. Thank you for this church and the people who are so consistent in coming to gather here on Sundays in fellowship. Uh, pray for Fred the Gator as he speaks, um, that you'd be with him and that you'd speak through him, give him confidence in what he's saying. In your name I pray, amen. All right, you may have a seat. And I encourage you, if you're comfortable with it, to just move to move closer because it's, it's actually nice today because we're in the shade and then you can also hear people's voices when we are able to sit closer. Um, one of our traditions is to have a spiritual conversation story, and today Evan Roan will be sharing over Zoom. So for those of us in person, you can, you can give your attention to this box over here. So hey everyone, I'm Evan. Um, I'm part of a book club with Ron Kim, and we're reading a book uh, called Where the Conflict Really Lies, Science, Religion, and Naturalism. And to be honest, the book is pretty dense, and at times it's pretty hard to follow. Uh, we recently read a chapter which was about miracles and quantum mechanics, which was especially hard for me to follow. Um, but there was a particular part in the book where the author brought up an argument against miracles, which was, if God intervenes by performing miracles, why does he choose to intervene in some cases and not others? Why does he heal some people and not others? And why does he turn water into wine and yet allow the Holocaust to happen? One of the members in our group asked the two Christians in our group, 
why we believe in miracles and if we knew anyone who had lost their faith because they were disappointed that God didn't intervene to stop suffering in their life. I responded that my faith in miracles basically just hinges on the person of Jesus, specifically on his resurrection. For me, I believe that the I believe in the historical biblical account of Jesus, and I believe it's credible and that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. My, my faith hinges on this one event. His resurrection makes his claims credible and miracles come along with that. I also said that I did know many people who had walked away from their faith because they believe God failed to intervene to stop suffering in their life. And I mentioned that Jesus himself mentioned that this would happen in the parable of the sower. We also discussed how Thomas, one of Jesus's closest friends, doubted him. The question as to why God chooses to intervene in some scenarios and not others is a question that I think all Christians need to wrestle with. In our book club, we discussed how a supernatural event, by definition, is something that occurs outside of nature, supernatural, and we therefore can't use nature to explain it. Our faith involves embracing known truths like our need for grace, but it also involves wrestling with mysteries like how and when a sovereign God chooses to intervene. I think that this conversation in our book club was helpful in conveying to my non-Christian friends that it is possible to simultaneously believe in the gospel while also wrestling with the mysteries of how God works. Thanks. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for Evan's story and for his courage in being part of a, a book club and being able to wrestle with difficult questions. And God, we, we praise you for the historical event of your resurrection, that it is the centerpiece of our faith, and it is the way in which we can understand that miracles are possible, um, because that historical event had reverberates throughout all of eternity. And so I, I, I can't completely, we can't completely explain. It's not always easy to explain a supernatural event. And yet we recognize that in that historical event of you raising, rising from the dead, which we celebrated two weeks ago, has an ongoing effect because you are alive today. You are risen indeed. Thank you for the testimony of that and thank you for all of us gathered here because we are witnesses of your resurrection and we are um, examples of your resurrection power living in each of us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Quicksilver Church. What we're gonna do right now is take a minute to welcome each other, but before you do, um, take out your phones and within the uh, service, within the bit.ly slash Quicksilver, we would love to connect with you. So just take a second and fill out the virtual connection card. And even if, even if you've been here before, if your information has been updated, we'd love to have you fill that out. Okay, so take a second to do that. And then for those of you on Zoom, you can also do the same thing. And Evan is also going to be setting up breakout rooms, which he can start right now. I'm going to ask you guys to have a chance to mingle with one another. We have, again, the bagels. And if you'd like to participate in communion, there are grape juice boxes and individually wrapped Biscoff crackers. Go for it. Hey, man. Cool shirt. What is my name? Austin. All right. We're going to get started. Go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. You guys hear me okay? Is it? Go ahead. Yeah. Hello? Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Today, uh, Fred the Gator, or as we call him, Fred. We call him Fred the Gator, but his actually his name is Fred Gillum. He's going to be speaking for us today. Come on up, Fred. Hello, everybody. Um, Yes, I'm uh, going to do things a little different for me today. I'm, I'm, I have my slides on my Kindle, and hopefully it will work. Um, and so we're continuing in our discussion of Genesis, and we're at Genesis 30, actually starting in uh, the end of Genesis 29. And I wanted to start off by... Um, what's the right way to put it, by giving away the store uh, and telling you what I, th I'm going to read something that I wrote back when I was in seminary. It was, um, 
anyway, it was sort of my magnum opus, and um, I sort of freaked out the professor because it was 36 pages long, and he wasn't expecting that, but um, he took it anyway, and he liked it. Anyway, I call it my, the name of it is uh, Nature and Character of God, and this part I'm, <laughs> I've, I've, I've called Metaphysical Whiskers, and the reason I'm, I say that is, um, I, it, it kind of gives you a, an idea of the way I think about God and how he interacts with his creation, which is maybe a little different from what people are used to hearing and thinking. Um, so, redemption. The greatest glory of God's sovereignty is that he can indeed allow creation to be free and even to oppose him and still somehow fulfill his purposes. He does this by a mighty creative act, a new creation called redemption. Redemption is God interacting with creation in such a way that creation in its full freedom is led to fulfill God's purposes even when there are wills present in creation that are opposed to his. The clearest statement of the dynamic of redemption is Joseph's statement to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The idea here is that evil is still evil, but God exercises his right creatively to merge the stream of evil actions into his own purposes so that they end up doing the good that he intends. And this is sort of the background way of thinking that I want to encourage us to at least explore, if you can't buy it wholesale, at least explore this way of thinking about things as we read um, Genesis 30, um, which is um, definitely a lot of, okay, well, to give, a, to give away the store too, uh, it's a very dysfunctional situation. So um, before we plunge into it, I want to mention um, a cultural note here, which is this won't make any sense Genesis 30, the whole, the whole Genesis 29, 30, that whole area there, the rivalry of the, uh, the sisters won't make any sense unless we see the way that culture viewed children. Our culture views children differently, and um, I, I actually ran, happened to run across an article that I posted on Slack which discusses the whole issue of how our, our culture and society views children. Um, there's a pretty negative view of children. Uh, the, the overall uh, situation is that we aren't replaced, well, I don't know about Asian, Asian culture, but we in general, US, are not replacing ourselves. Um, our, the only way, the only reason the population of the U.S. is growing is through immigration, and this is a practically universal um, situation in the first world. And so the article calls it a neo-pagan view of you have to kind of wrestle with yourself. Um, nevertheless, oh, and, and <laughs> excuse me for a little politics here. I, I I really like doing devil's dictionary type definitions. So I have two devil's dictionary definitions. The first one is the definition of planned parenthood, an organization that helps you to avoid becoming a parent. Um, and then reproductive rights, the right not to reproduce no matter what else you do. So if you think about it, you know, all right. So I hope I haven't totally lost my audience by saying that, but here we go. Okay, so now, when we look at God's covenant promises, we find uh, uh, the things that he said to Abraham, to Isaac. He says uh, in chapter 22, 16 to 18, By myself I have sworn, says Yahweh, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. 
and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed or heard my voice. So, you know, there's definitely a, uh, um, a cultural bias toward having a lot of children, right? Anyway, but that's not the point. The point that this is God's agenda. God's agenda is through Abraham uh, and his, his offspring, his lineage, is that on the bingo card? Anyway, on the, uh, the, through the lineage of Abraham to bless the entire earth, okay? Um, and then, so here's the question. God, this is, you know, God's agenda and God's challenge. How can God use the dysfunctional mess of Abraham's lineage to create a people in whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed? Okay, we recall the fact that, you know, we have Abraham and Isaac, and we, we recall the fact that Isaac is spiritually somewhat blind, um, doesn't have a lot of spiritual perception, um, and we, find, we have a total dysfunctionality between Esau and Jacob. Um, there is some question as to the relationship between um, Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, did she really, you know, were they really like one in heart and spirit? Kind of iffy there because she goes and essentially defeats his, uh, uh, Isaac's intentions. And the result of that, of course, is Esau and Jacob are ready to, or uh, Esau's ready to kill Jacob, you know. And it, it, it goes back to Cain and Abel, right? There's this whole brothers just don't get along. And that's a theme that per persists through the rest of, through the whole book of Genesis. Um, anyway, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So how do we think about this? What does God do? to deal with dysfunctionality and sin throughout history, okay? And I would suggest for, suggest the idea of contrary motion. And uh, the idea in, in music, contrary motion is when two lines of music go in opposite directions. One line is going down, the other line is going up. In, uh, in, in marriage or relationships, there's another term called reverse affect. And that is when one spouse or partner is going down. Maybe they're depressed or angry or something. And the other spouse does this reverse affect. They, they try to go in a, in a positive direction. And, and that's considered one of the best signs in, of a, a strong marriage is reverse affect. When one spouse doesn't allow him or herself to be dragged down, by the negative feelings and 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 uh, directionality of the of the other spouse, but rather goes in a positive direction and tries to make things better. Um, and my contention is, this is God's chosen way of dealing with dysfunction and sin, um, reverse affect or contrary motion. So as we read um, Genesis twenty nine through thirty. Not the whole thing, but um, I would suggest, I would encourage you to listen for reverse affect or contrary motion in what God does. So I'm going to read, uh, let me see if I can get to it. Ah. Whoops, wrong button. Sorry about that, people. Like I said, I'm, this is a little bit new for me, doing it this way. Okay. Okay, so we recall that um, Jacob uh, worked for seven years to get Rachel, and um, what we thought, what we find is that on hun the honeymoon night, um, um, Laban pulled the old switcheroo and um, tricked the trickster. And when Jacob woke up, he was, to put it mildly, surprised. So let's read it. Um, I'm starting at verse 31. So, so oh, I'll start at verse 30. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. Now listen for a reverse affect or contrary motion here, because this is what God is doing. 
When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So, Re so Leah conserved, uh, conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. All these names somehow correspond to some uh, idea that's mentioned there. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, children out of this poor woman who is, you know, who, who is, would otherwise have gotten the short end of the stick. Okay, so let's look at, uh, starting at Genesis 30. Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. Oh, that's that envy word there. That's dysfunctional if you ask me, and said to Jacob, give me children or I die. So, so what is Jacob doing wrong here? You know, he's thinking, you're the one I would rather have children with, but you know, nothing is, nothing is coming. You know, what can I do? So he says, Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. Now remember, he married her because she was beautiful and he worked seven years and he loved her and wanted her now his anger is aroused and he said am i in the place of god who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb oh right you know i mean poor woman now she's the one who's getting the short end of the stick this is one of these reversals you see often in the in the bible you see for example esau if we we, we call esau he was the the he-man, like I, I, I compared him to the, the high school quarterback who was, you know, dated the cheerleader and everything went right for him. And, and, and Jacob was the, the nerd who sat off in the corner with no friends and, and couldn't get a date if his life depended on it. And yet Jacob gets all the, gets the birthright and the blessing and Esau, poor guy, right? He, you know, he, he, he gets his parents angry by marrying the wrong women. And, um, you know, he loses his birthright, loses his blessing. So that's a reversal of what we would expect in human terms. And similarly here, we have the beautiful woman, the one who seems favored, the lucky one, who gets the short end of the stick, at least for now. So she said, here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. Well, this, this is familiar, right? Remember Abraham did, or, or Sarah did something similar. Um, and this seems to be in line with what God wants because um, then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as wife. And Jacob went into her and Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said... God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. But that wasn't really what she wanted. But at the very least, it was something, okay? She's saying, okay, I'm, I, I have a son, even though it's not from my body, it's from my handmaid's body. And, you know, God has judged my case and heard my voice, okay? Um, and, and Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And now, now here again we hear the dysfunctionality. Then Rachel said, with great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Nap, Naphtali. So we hear this, this whole um, envy and rivalry between the sisters just goes through the whole thing. Now, what do you think is going to happen to these kids as they grow up? <laughs> we'll, well, you, you know, the rest of the book will, will give us uh, a lot of material to work with. Um, <clears throat> then Leah saw that she had stopped bearing. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as wife. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? You know, so Leah said, well, two can play at that game, you know. 
uh, and Leah's maid Zilpah uh, bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad. Basically, you know, I have so many kids, we can make a troop out of these kids. You know? uh, and Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then, then Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. <clears throat> now Reuben went, okay, so, so at this point we're starting to see that Leah has found happiness with the way God has dealt with her, okay? Both her own sons and the sons she had through her, uh, through her handmaids, there's, there's so many of them that she feels blessed. She feels like, she, she no longer feels like she got the short end of the stick, okay? And um, so now we get to the, the Mandrakes story, which is a very weird story, but, um, so it says, let's see, Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. So mandrakes, what are mandrakes? Well, they're not the same thing that we think of as mandrakes now, which is a plant that has roots that are like that. So it looks like uh, the legs of a human. And uh, they were just an aphrodisiac, well, we don't know if they're aphrodisiac or not, but they smelled really good, they're perfumey, and they were seen as an aphrodisiac, okay? So, um, <clears throat> Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But he said to her, is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. So basically, Leah bought the right to sleep with Je uh, Jacob with these mandrakes, okay? When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. Okay, I will leave that uncommented. And, she, and he lay with her that night and God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. So, and Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Ishkar, Ishakar. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Uh, and Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulon. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Well, it turns out that Leah is still hoping for the love of Jacob after all this time. And yet, she never gets it. What she gets instead is a whole bunch of kids. And that seems to be enough for her, you know? Um, it's, it's not what she really wanted, but it seems to be enough for her. It's a, she sees it as a blessing from God. Afterwards, uh, let's see, then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son, okay? So what you have here is nobody, nobody loses out. Nobody loses out completely, okay? Uh, even Rachel, who, who God has sort of turned the tables on, nevertheless has a son, which is, which is uh, Joseph. And she ends up also with another son, which we, uh, with Benjamin. Unfortunately, that's, um, that's when she dies. So what we saw there is how, how the children that Leah bore caused her to praise God, right? And... Um, this is a consistent thing about her. She seems to be the more spiritual person. Okay. Um, sorry. I'm switching between things like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, sorry, I, I wound up completely. Yes. Okay, so. Um, hmm. I have all these slides here that I already went through. Okay, so dysfunctionality. Both women have to share Jacob. 
that's really hard on women, right? I don't know how Jacob felt about it. Obviously, he got into arguments with Rachel and so on, but, you know, he was kind of passive in the whole thing. He'd just go where he was told to go. There's something a little bit weird about that. But anyway, um, they have a rivalry based on looks, but Leah got the best of it. God made her fertile. That's a contrary motion. And eventually, God remembered Rachel and opened her womb. No indication the mandrakes had anything to do with it, but that's what happened. Okay, and so, um, oh gosh, what's wrong with my slides here? Yeah, this doesn't work very well. Sorry about that, everyone. So, what happened? How did, what did God get out of this? Well, he got 12 kids. And so he starts off with a, a people of Jacob, who was on the run. He had nowhere to, he, he didn't have any place because if he went back to his home, he was going to get killed. So he, he ran, and then he got, the, got tricked, and now, through all this trickery and dysfunctionality, God has 12, well, he has 11 right now. It'll become 12. He has 12 kids. So that's a pretty big family. And if you think they all have kids, you're starting to get this geometric progression, and it looks like, well, maybe God will get his uh, his, his people that are more n numerous than the sands of the sea and so on. But we still have a dysfunctional mess on our hands. For example, Reuben. May, may, uh, this, is, this is giving away some of what's going to happen. So, spoiler alert. Reuben sleeps with Bilhah, which costs him the birthright. Okay? Um, Judah decides he's going to leave this dysfunctional family doesn't want any part of it. It's such a mess. Uh, and of course, there's Joseph, who they sell down the river. So, so one of their brothers gets sold down the river. They would have killed him, but they thought, well, let's make some money off it at least. And then you have Tamar, who basically redeems, um, redeems uh, um, Judah. And then you have, and, and this is the contrary motion. So... We have the three dysfunctionalities, which is um, uh, um, Reuben, Judah, and Joseph being sold down the river. And then we have the God's contrary motion. Tamar redeems um, um, Judah, and Joseph saves the family because he was in the right place at the right time. And he was a Christ figure in all this. Okay? So... Um, I don't know what my time is here. Let me see. Okay, I have a story I want to tell, which, which I think really shows um, how this kind of thing works, In at least has worked for me. This passage is not really about me, or, you know, it's not really a personal passage. It's more of a big picture. Here's what God is doing in the large. But the idea that God operates by taking dysfunctionality and redeeming it, I think is powerful for all of us. And so for me, um, my family was, I, I mean, it was dysfunctional. My parents were divorced. One of my, and, and, I, and I say this with all, you know, hesitancy, but one of my uh, early memories is, which when I was about maybe three years old, is li my father literally holding me by the neck and shaking me while my mom was yelling, you're going to kill him, you're going to kill him. He was so angry at me for, I guess I misbehaved in a restaurant or something. Um, and my father left the family, they, they got divorced, there was a lot of weirdness about that. And um, so, and my mom was extremely unhappy. And her, she had a tremendously dysfunctional upbringing. And I won't go into details, it was, but I, I would see, think you would probably be horrified if you heard about my mom. And uh, so she was a very um, dysfunctional, bitter, angry person. Though she did become a Christian, and, and I think that got her through life in some fashion. Uh, and eventually all of my brothers and sister became Christians. But right now, right here now, I'm the only one in my family that is married and has stayed married. Now, I'm not saying that as a boast. I'm saying that more as, you know, thank God because he has 
enabled me in all my dysfunctionality to stay in my marriage. Now, that's the, that's my side of the family. My my wife's side of the family, well, they didn't get divorced. And and but but she would tell me about her how her mother totally disrespected her dad, called him names, I won't go into what name she called him, tried to kick him out of the family every chance she got. And he would, he would basically only come home to eat and then he would stay out. They, they lived in Taiwan. He, they, he would stay out in the, you know, in the neighborhood and, and, and my wife would say, she, he never talked to the kids. He would talk to the kids of the neighbors and play with them, but he never played with her or her, her, her siblings. And one time when, um, my wife said, you know, sometimes I think I treat you like my mom treated my father. And my wife, my wife is emotionally, basically emotionally paralyzed. Um, and in many ways, well, we have this relationship where I have, a, I have a, an enmeshed relational style. My wife has an avoidant relational style. So we do this really entertaining little dance where I try to come close to my wife and she backs away. And if you want to hear a one sentence description of the 30 years of my life with my wife, that was it. I approach, she backs away. Okay? And, well, what was the result of that? Well, the result of that is it's painful. Uh, I, and I have certain issues that I go through repeatedly because of that. I'm, I'm always looking for that connection, that, that sense of, anyway, I, I have attachment issues, I have, I have affection issues, and so on and so forth. And that, that's hard for me. But here's something that happened which made me realize that God had done something right in our family. Uh, I was talking with my um, sister-in-law, with my sister-in-law my son-in-law's sister. And he was talking about how uh, he married my daughter and um, he, uh, he told his sister that he knew she was the right one because all the other girls she dated, he dated, all were constantly looking to be reassured that they were beautiful and that they were lovable and that they were loved and they're always looking for that reassurance over and over again. My daughter, she, he, he said, my daughter didn't have that. She was confident. She knew she was loved. She knew that she was beautiful. She knew. She had just had the sense that she was okay. She didn't need to grab onto somebody or something in order to make herself worthwhile. And when, when uh, my sister-in-law told me that, I said, wow. I said, how did that happen, you know? And the only way I could think of how it happened was I kept saying to God, God, please take my children because I'm gonna screw them up. And I would pray that over and over again, take my children and make them your children. And God answered that prayer. And both my daughter and my son um, seemed to be doing pretty well. My son is a pastor, and my daughter uh, has a couple of grandkids. And um, my my daughter was my daughter tested off the Stanford Binet scale when she took the Stanford Binet test. They had to extrapolate her result. Her kids are just as smart as that, and of course, her husband is a prophet at Berkeley. So. They're super smart, but they're also super fun and lovable. So what I'm seeing here is the way that God has taken the dysfunctionality in my family, my wife's family, you know, all of that generational dysfunctionality, and brought about something really good and really wonderful. Something that I can say, thank you, God. You did this, even though I was a mess, I'm still a mess. My wife's a mess. We're all a mess, but somehow you brought something beautiful out of it all. So, oops, sorry about that. So the, the conclusion, um, I'm going to wrap it up here. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. 
that's the principle of God's, God's grace and God's redemption. We cannot sin our way out from under God's grace. You know, no matter what, you know, no matter what dysfunctionality we're caught up in, what, what sin we're caught up in, God's grace is there offering redemption, offering relationship, begging us to be reconciled, okay? Um, so that as sin reigned in death, even so great might, grace might reign in righteous, through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus Christ is the ultimate in God's contrary motion, the cross, right? Um, the cross is the utter failure of humanity. The most, the most religious people in the world, the Jews, the people who knew God, who had the oracles of God, who had heard God for thousands of years, didn't recognize him when he showed up. The most just people in the world, the Romans, the Romans who boasted in their law, there was even a country whose king gave his country to the Romans because he so admired Roman law. The Romans condemned the only innocent person who ever lived. And that was a human failure. But, it's the, it, but in that very moment, it was the utter triumph of God's grace. Because that is where God's salvation entered into the human condition and raised us up with Christ so that we could be reconciled to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that sin is not too strong for you. Dysfunctionality is not too strong for you. That you're always taking those things and reversing them. You're, you're, you ride the wave of creation, letting people be what they are and be who they want to be and yet taking all that and weaving it into your purposes and redeeming it and recreating it and making it so that creation moves towards where you want it to go. We thank you that we can be part of that, that we can identify with that. And in doing so, we are raised with Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget your communion stuff, Fred. Oh, yeah. Can we stand together? We're going to be celebrating the contrary motion of the cross. That's what I was thinking as Fred was preaching about this contrary motion. Um, Evan was sharing his spiritual conversation story. And as Fred was talking, I thought, resurrection is the contrary motion of uh, the depravity of this universe. And that's how Fred closed. So thank you for that. Um, if you have your... cracker <laughs> can open that up and we celebrate as believers as followers of Jesus what this represents uh, this cracker I'm holding up is the body of Jesus broken in our behalf and what it means what it's what its significance is that it is a contrary motion of the dysfunctionality of the human race and so my prayer is that as we partake together, we would remember not only Jesus' sacrifice for us, but we also recognize what it means for us as a new people. We celebrate this communally. And that's why on Zoom, hopefully you have your cameras on and you can at least see me. Um, so let's remember together the sacrifice of Jesus. Not only did Jesus give of his body, he also shed his blood, and I am struggling with the straw. I got it. You do not have to drink this entire thing, because that might be too much sugar for you. Um, but just a little bit <laughs> represents his blood, which was shed in our behalf. And I think we sang this earlier from Come, Come Thou Found, that all of our righteousness comes from is from Jesus. And that righteousness is kind of a strange righteousness. It's a it's a righteousness that comes by blood, and we don't think of blood as cleansing. But when we um, are standing before the throne room of God, the only way we have to be righteous is by being cleansed by what this juice box represents. Okay, and so I just want to give this kind of a toast to what Jesus accomplished on our behalf and this blood that covers. This is his blood shed for us. 
God, we are awed and humbled and perhaps even afraid. of the dysfunction that we're surrounded by, the pain and grief and death that is part of our existence. And Lord, and yet Lord, you have chosen in your sovereign power to offer your son and in the contrary motion of the universe, bring him back to life. And so he is risen today and we celebrate that resurrection because we have his resurrection power. We sing in celebration of that. We pray this in your name. Amen. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting. I won't be wanting. makes me rest fields of grain quiet streams even though I walk through the valley of death and die I will not fear, cause you are with me, you are with me. Shepherd's staff comforts me, you are my feast in the presence of enemies. of God forever. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting. I won't be wanting. Makes me rest in fields of green, quiet streams. Even though I walk through the valley of death and die. Are you hurting and broken with 
within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling service where we have a chance to, uh, for anyone to share something encouraging, 
relevant and addressing everyone. And so if you want to take a minute just to think about, I'll give you guys a prompt. You don't, you don't, it doesn't require a prompt, but one thing that I thought about as Fred was speaking is what's an experience of contrary motion you've had? What's a story of God working contrary motion in your life? I would love to hear a word of encouragement. If you'd like to share, you can just come up, or if you're on Zoom, you can just speak. Again, brief, relevant, and encouraging. Hey everyone, my name is Karen. One brief moment of contrary motion I experienced very recently is that my friend Debbie recently returned and relocated back to the Bay Area. Um, I'm really happy about that. Praise God. <laughs> For me, the context of how God has been shaping that in my life is I've moved around the past few years a few times. Demi and I actually met when we were both living in Beijing. And apparently we had met. We are actually attending the same church. Um, but we didn't really get close until we both discovered that we were living here. And for me, that was such a precious moment to know that someone from my previous life, previous life, life stage, um, could match me and sort of understand where I was thinking, what I was thinking, what I was going through in that transition back to the US. Um, and then it was really sad when she told me she was leaving to relocate to the East Coast. Um, and that had actually happened a few times in my life where I felt like, oh, finally a friendship, you know, it's there. And I think this is something a lot of us may experience. Um, and I think I made peace with it and I just trusted God that, you know, he would continue to make community for me. And he has through Quicksilver and he has through a lot of other friends as well um, and through my family. But then this beautiful moment of very unexpected grace came through where she told me um, we met up a few weeks ago because she was in town for an interview. And then I had no idea that that would be a possibility. Um, but yeah, where I feel like I'm not sure who was moving in what direction, um, but it was both beautiful in its unexpectedness and just sort of the the back and forth and the push and pull of friendship. Um, so God has really heartened um, me through this experience and also just through the general encouragement of um, me trying to sometimes logically process who are my friends, where will they be, where do I have to go to find them, and God shows up. So praise God, I'm glad Demi is back. <laughs> Lord God, thank you for the beauty of today. Thank you for the, the wonder of creation. And thank you for the beauty of relationships and friendship. And Lord, would we, would you manifest your presence today as we build relationships with each other? There's nothing more precious in life, and it is what you came to this earth for, to restore a relationship between us and you, and to restore a relationship between us and each other. God, would we value that as the highest and most precious gift? And you started it. In Jesus' name, amen. I was an orphan lost at the fall Running away when I hear you call Follow your words, your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne But Father, you loved me still And in love before you laid the world's foundation Predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone You left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible cost But just your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone But nothing I did could ever atone Jesus, you paid my debt By your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation and born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The Spirit you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own. A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone. The Spirit you moved in me. 
at your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened on my dark and heart the light of Christ has shone called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Just a couple things as you guys are, are departing from here. It could not be a more beautiful day. I <laughs> just want to recognize that. And it's also Church Planning Sunday for Acts 29. And so other churches across the nation, across the world, are celebrating church plants. We are a church plant. We were birthed during a pandemic. And we are an example of contrary motion in that regard. And so I'll be sending out a video later today. It's hard to show videos um, here. Um, but I'll be sending out a video later on through our Slack and through email. Um, to those who signed up, registered for our service about church plants and how Acts 29 is um, planting churches all over the world. And then we're also going to be having some ultimate frisbee. Nick Fong is going to be leading that over there in the black. And so if you want to stick around and play some ultimate, that will be happening. We're going to have a finance update next Sunday. So you'll be able to, we'll be able to praise God together for how God has provided. And I'll send out details as well. Garden, uh, Garden City Church. Quick Silver Church. <laughs> Quick Silver Church. Quick Silver Church. We are a church plant. Go in the peace of Jesus. We did it. We did it. We did it. Barely without Anna. Yeah.